okay. Great. <laughs> Life is good. All right. Oh, my God. Oh, I saw a documentary called Skyline about a week ago. <laughs> what did you think of that? I thought it was pretty cool. I, you know, I thought that, uh, that they did it. I mean, I know that you and uh, you and that other guy, uh, Edwards, had a falling out. I mean, you were talking about it, too. And, uh, you know, he... I mean, it was definitely clear that y'all didn't like each other, although he seemed a little <laughs> more snarky, I, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. It just, the, the, the whole comment about the, uh, the, SEC, the SEC and stuff, you know, and uh, yeah. so I was like. Yeah, for yeah. the record, that was really kind of bullshit. I was really frustrated yeah. with that. Um, yeah. I did not ever get investigated by the SEC. That's just Brad uh -huh. kind of doing something out of proportion. But, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was, I, I liked aspects of that video. Uh, truth be told, um, I think they really biased the story. If you watch it again, watch it again uh -huh. and notice this, that all of my stuff uh -huh. is totally unscripted and they followed me for like three days. Uh -huh. But everybody else in that video had, you know, a nice backdrop, and they were all, uh -huh. all kind of dressed professionally, and they were only on. Right. They only they only had about an hour of interview uh -huh. time, whereas uh -huh. for me, they followed me for three full days. They caught all kinds of stuff that was kind of unscripted and and spontaneous, uh -huh. uh, and you get a different kind of video that way. And so yeah. they kind of made me a little bit of a clown character getting in and out of my car, which was kind of ridiculous. And, yeah. Yeah, and I was, okay. some of the, uh, some of the scenes, you remember the, the scene where there's all those, uh, those middle school kids. Um, yeah. I remember that. That was at the end. Yeah. Well, so that was crazy because well, what actually happened there was I had those kids kind of, entranced enthralled for like an hour and a half we uh -huh. had the main group of kids for about an hour and then another session of just six kids for about 45 minutes uh -huh. they don't show hardly any of that they just have this little this little kid with attitudes like i don't get it all snotty and walking away uh -huh. um and I'm like, you know, they they totally clipped that one section out uh -huh. to kind of discredit the whole two hours at that school. So I was uh -huh. pretty frustrated with some of the choices of clips that they took. Yeah. Because uh, I know there was a lot more to that story, but uh, yeah. I talked to them about it and they said, you know, we, you know, every story needs characters and you're an interesting character. So. Uh -huh. There has to be conflict, so they put Edwards and I against each other. You know, our yeah. Edwards' conflict is has been over and done. Got to be more than ten years. Uh, we stopped yeah. working together in two thousand three, uh -huh. so you know, I haven't seen Edwards. I haven't been in the same room as Edwards since two thousand seven. Right. So, like, they imply that this is a current ongoing feud and the, tr uh -huh. the truth is i could give a shit uh -huh. right <laughs> i don't care at all right. Uh, right and i don't think edwards cares like i don't think he's like staying up night like oh that damn lame guy like i just yeah. like I give the guy some credit i just don't think he, i i don't think i rate that much attention from him and he doesn't rate that much attention from me but this video makes it seem like it uh -huh. is a current feud and that's right, just bullshit. Right. so there was a lot of this video that i i didn't really like that much. i got you well i did notice that they were following you around and yeah you're right the other people that were being interviewed they had a background and they were sitting yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that was very scripted very scripted yeah, yeah. what they did so. yeah so i did notice that yeah and the thing with the car we had to climb out on the passenger side <laughs> yeah
<laughs> and you know, I'm I'm six four and you know yeah. two fifteen. Like my car is kind of a clown car to begin with, uh -huh. but they didn't have to show me looking like an idiot. Like that was a yeah. that was that was a chunk of editing. Right? Yeah. So I, yeah, I suppose. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how to add it to the story, but I mean, I I just figured okay. I, I, to me, I got the impression while well, you had fallen on this was kind of a things had fallen on hard times, and this is what you were dealing with, I guess. But but you know that and that part that part is true. I really did go through some really rough days for a while. Uh, they didn't start normalizing and getting kind of back to a, a decent level until really about three years ago. So um, so that that part was true. I I really was struggling. Um, but there's a lot of ways that you could show me struggling without making me look like an idiot. And I felt like I yeah, think I they kind of turned me into a comic book character there. But no, they, yeah, they, I, was like, yeah. I was glad that they did the video. And I do think that there was some cool stuff there. Um, oh, most people that I talked to really think the video was pretty good. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's. I think it's just that I'm so close to it, and I know what the rest uh -huh. of the story is that wasn't in that video. Uh -huh. um, I think that's one of the reasons why I'm glad you're doing this project, right? Because right. Yeah. I want these stories to be told. Uh, uh -huh. I just. I just would like it to be, you know, more. You know, to mimic. Uh, a station I'm not fa a fan of, but to mimic the idea of fair and balanced, I think a story. I think this the uh -huh. other story should be it should be pretty. Because uh, yeah, I mean, Edwards has his take on it. Uh, Pete uh -huh. Swan has his take on it. Uh, everybody has their own their own version of 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 true. So yeah, your job is to kind of sort out all the various stories and figure out what's right there so yeah well cool. i'm excited about your project hopefully uh hopefully people will read your your book and then compare it to the skyline video there's another video that i think is coming out in march that i think should be really good um it's called um it's called shoot the moon a guy okay. named ben harrison's doing that so uh yeah little by little the story is going to get told so that's cool yeah, yeah. good yeah. Okay. Well. Okay. Going back to what I wrote here, it says that you fall in twenty or twenty two thousand and one. It said that you didn't join the team right away, but that's kind of when you kind of heard about it. And then I guess in spring of two thousand two, that's when you started. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had. I had done. Uh, I had posted something in space dot com on a message board and started getting a little bit of attention about the idea of commercial development in space. In 2001, that really did seem like science fiction. Uh, Edwards heard about me from that, and he contacted me about the fall, October, November, October, I think, of uh, 2001. And I was really intrigued, but I was really, really, really skeptical so I didn't really join the team until really the spring of 2002. Um, I, it wasn't until I kind of fact checked some of the stuff he was working on and I started making my own friends and alliances within the space community that I'm like, all right, this guy is not crazy. He really does have something. Let's, let's see where it leads. Um, yeah, so that that's when I really started. It's 2001 introduced to it. Um, you know, I'd read science fiction long before then about the elevator. I just never really thought of it as a real world project. So I was pretty surprised when Edward showed up. Um, but then, uh, January, February, March of 2003, um, started investigating. Uh, by the summer of 2003, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, 2002, by the summer of 2002, I was pretty deeply involved. Uh -huh. And we had a really big conference. We went on a lot of trips together, Edwards and I. 
Uh, our conference started making international headlines, so that was pretty amazing. Um, and things looked things looked really good that summer, two thousand two. Um, uh, but by the fall into the winter, we'd gone out to NASA. Gosh, three times I think three times to ask for more follow-on funding. And at the time, NIAC, the NASA Institute for Advanced Concepts, it didn't have any component for follow-on funding because NIAC was designed to be a 50-year time horizon. So it was only ever supposed to be paper studies that came out of it. And so when we went back to NASA to petition for more capital, uh, they were like, sorry, we got, we got nothing for you. Uh, was really hard and so we branched out and we talked to uh, National Reconnaissance Agency, CIA, NOAA, basically anybody with a satellite, anybody with a space program, Air Force Research Lab uh, and we all just we just kept getting shot down over and over and over again uh, and then the uh, fast forward to 2003 the Space Shuttle Columbia crashes uh, again, we make headlines because people are asking, uh, you know, is there a better way of doing this? Is there, you know, we're going to space, we got this big clunky space shuttle, is there a better way of doing it? And so we got a lot of attention from that. I don't want to sound all ghoulish or, or opportunistic. Uh, I, I was well, watching the space land when it happened and it, I was, Balling. I was crying my eyes out because uh, uh -huh. that was a big deal to me. I mean, I remember the uh, Challenger exploding too. I watched that one. So, uh, so all of a sudden, we just got a lot of national and international attention asking the question if there's another way of doing it. And that's when Edwards and I had a really big argument about what do we do next because we knew we were running out of money. And that's when we split. So I, I created Liftport kind of immediately after that. Um, I think the crash happened in February. We had our big argument a couple of days later, maybe two weeks uh -huh. later, in March. And then I created Liftport kind of immediately after in April. So, uh -huh. um, yeah, so we've been the Space Elevator Company f since one way or another, even during our zombie days. Uh, since 2003, April 2003. Yeah. Okay. So the 2003 is when the Columbia disaster happened, and then that's when you all split up? Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, okay, that's good. I got that down right. Okay. And then so that's when you, that's when you set up Liftport, and then you started doing research on carbon nanotubes and, uh, and yep. tethered balloons and robotics. Exactly right, yep. Okay. Yeah. 2000... Three, uh, I took a road trip. Believe it or not, I took a road trip with my folks, and uh, and I think I stopped in at one, two, three, four. I stopped in at four or five. Four for sure. I think the other one I didn't get till later. I went to four carbon nanotube labs across the country just investigating like okay what are you doing how does it work why does this work what are your breakthroughs do you think there's some commercial development out of this um, <laughs> they all assured me that yes there was some commercial this was 2003 they all assured me that oh yeah we got the strongest string in the world let's go build it uh, uh, totally wrong across the board Everybody was wrong. I was wrong. They were wrong. Everybody was wrong. But it looked really good at the time. It looked really good at the time. Uh -huh. um, yeah. I think over 2003, 4, and 5, I must have visited 8, maybe 10 nanotech labs. No, it's got to be more than that. It's probably 10 or 12 nanotech labs. Um, all of which promised 
uh, meters long contigu contiguous carbon nanotubes stronger than steel. Uh -huh. Like, you guys can't all be right. And uh, it turns out none of them were right. So, I mean, that was definitely a lesson. Uh, I, I learned a lot of lessons from those road trips. Um, and eventually we kind of, we kind of down selected. We, it looked really, it really looked like uh, there was some technology out of MIT and the National Renewable Energy Lab that we really, really liked. And we thought that each one of them had part of the answer, but they weren't talking to each other. So like, you know, here's MIT, they have these breakthroughs and here's National Renewable Energy Lab and their, their breakthroughs, but they weren't talking to each other. So they kind of let us be the go-between. And so our idea was like push these two texts together and get a super material. Uh, absolutely did not work. Nothing, nothing about that worked. Um, uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, and, you know, I was, I was self-funding most of this. Uh, I took on some loans. I used my building as collateral for those loans. Uh, we were so confident. I oh, God, we were so confident that we leased a 100,000 square foot production facility Jersey, that was a big mistake. That was a really big mistake. Um, and it was, and, it, and that was actually the thing that kind of brought this whole crashing down was that it's like tech isn't ready, the materials aren't ready, the team isn't ready, we don't have enough capital. Uh -huh. Kill it. We, we wound up having to kill that. So that was a really, that was a really hard lesson uh, to pull the plug on that. But it looked really good at the time. You know, it's hard to, it's, it's easy to look back and look at and see where the errors were. But at the time when we're in the thick of it, it was really, it looked really good. It really did. We had, uh, there were so many errors. We didn't have reproducibility. Almost every single time we ran one of these nanotech experiments, we got wildly different results. Uh, and that was everything from the methodologies weren't consistent for the testing to we got, we got air, we got air in the, uh, the furnace process. So instead of having, you know, some super clean, I think it was methane at the time, some super clean flow of, uh, of gases, we had dirty gases going into the system, so of course the output is always going to be dirty. Right. So, so it's just those kinds of things we could dissect after the fact, but at the time, it was it was just a mystery to us. I mean, we put a lot of time and money into it, and it just got nothing useful out of it. So it was a frustrating experience, but. Um, once we kind of officially pulled the plug on that, uh, we had been working on robotics and lifter robots uh, for a while, for quite a while. Um, but when, you say, when, you, we, when you say you pulled the plug on that, you're not talking about New Jersey. You're talking about um, back in the Seattle area, what you had going on there. Yeah, no, we, I'm, I'm saying we pulled the plug on the entire nanotech problem. So oh, okay. we stopped working with a few labs. We stopped working in New Jersey. We, 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 never, we never even opened factory. We had a lease for it, but I think I visited it six times. Uh, never, never once. Uh, did anything more than turn on the lights like we never moved a single piece of equipment in there We never hired anybody. It was it was a disaster. It was really It was a very frustrating experience and it actually felt good to turn it off once we realized this isn't gonna work And we just had to back away from it, it was actually kind of a relief 
uh, uh, made a lot of people mad though. I mean, yeah. you know, made us mad, right? Um, yeah. But it just, from a purely economics perspective, it just simply didn't make sense. And you know, I think that here we are 10, 12, 15 years later, no one else has cracked that problem either, right? No one else has solved the problem either. So in a way, this 15 years has kind of indicated that, yeah, it was hard to close down that research problem, but it was the only thing we could do at, at, at the time, and I, I do feel somewhat justified in my decision now, 15 years later, because there's really smart people working on nanotech, and yeah. no one figured it out. Um, we figured out that uh, everybody assumes that you just need one breakthrough. You need a breakthrough in strength. But it's actually six breakthroughs. It's uh, it's length strength, alignment, chirality, the chirality is the twist of the nanotube itself, uh, functionalization, you have to actually make it useful in a, a matrix of some kind, um, and you have to have mass production. And so it's cool to think, okay, we only need one breakthrough, but knowing that you need six breakthroughs in order to build a string strong enough for an elevator to space, you don't schedule six breakthroughs, and you can't right. imagine how much money it's going to take to get. So it was, it was, uh, it was a relief to finally <laughs> shut down that research. It was certainly frustrating, and and we put a lot of time and effort into it, but we we weren't going anywhere with it. So, so that all basically ended, I guess, two thousand five or so, two thousand six. Okay. We knew we were in trouble in 2005, I think, and then we ended it in 2006. I think that's how it turned out. Um, and concurrent to that, we were actually making some really solid progress on the uh, the robotics. We got we got real. I'm really proud of our robotics team. I, I'm proud of our nanotech guys too. Don't get me wrong, but. Uh, uh -huh. The, the the robotics guys actually succeeded, whereas whereas we just learned a lot of lessons the hard way on the uh, on the nanotech side. Um, the robotics guys, uh, and it's you know it's it was uh, it was primarily guys, but certainly the gals had a lot to contribute there. Um, yeah, you know, we started out as as basic as you can imagine, just uh, just a bunch of folks sitting around um, using Legos, just mm -hmm. just building out of Legos. Oh, the uh, Mindstorm. No, no, no. We pre-did Mindstorm. We were we were oh. we were we, we did we did it the hard way. Um, there was a pack. So Mindstorm came out, I think, in two thousand and. Five, and I think we built our first version in 2003 and four, and it was super small. And we have it on our, our YouTube channel. Um, it's a robot that's like literally this big, just straight out of Legos, and it it climbs up and down. We had a, we had a test stand in the office that was probably five feet tall. Uh, we actually built this first at my uh, at my best friend's house. Um, we're just we're just sitting around uh, one one day one weekend whatever I don't know what we're doing but I'm like hey let's go build a robot and so you know we're we're pretty serious nerds and so we pulled out boxes of Legos uh, at, at my best friend's house down in his uh, down in his computer room and uh, that's where the first ones get built it was it was really a lot of fun it was really a lot of fun. Um, and then over time, we started messing with that design a little bit, and big boxy ones turn into long, thin ones. And that was actually kind of an important distinction. Uh, once the robots started getting longer and thinner, the center of mass of the robot changed, and that gave us a lot more control. The big boxy ones were all wobbly. Um, and then over time, uh, those robots got more and more sophisticated. We built our first 
true blue robot uh, again at my best friend's house David uh, we took spare scrap from his garage and we call this thing Frankenstein it's hideous it's a hideous robot made out of plywood and all the junk that was around David's house uh, 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 but we're very proud of that robot. Uh, uh, it's it's got a special place in our heart because it's really the first, it's the first real robot that actually looks like a robot to climb up and down string, and it climbed like eight, ten, twelve feet. Like it was back and forth, back and forth. It's dumb and thick, but it's it's our first it's our first real robot. And then over time, um, we. Uh, I, my building, I told you about my building, um, we had this cantilevered arm hanging out the window with a string going back and down, back and forth to the, uh, to the parking lot. And so we climbed four stories then and then uh, five stories. And then we went to the roof, six stories down to, down to the uh, parking lot. Um, Eventually went out to MIT to the Green Building, which is uh, 17 stories in uh, in November. That was a pretty big deal. That's also on our YouTube channel, um, and that was that was the beginning of a snowstorm. So there was that was a crazy day. Um, the robot actually snapped the safety line uh, just just before we started that um, that climb. MIT's security came up and said, hey, we need you to put a safety line on this thing. And the wind is whipping around like this. And so uh -huh. got the main climbing ribbon and then the safety line gets gets wrapped uh -huh. around the climbing ribbon. And so our robot, uh -huh. is just, it gets stuck for about 20 seconds. And we're just about to you know, cancel the experiment when it snaps the safety line and just keeps on, keeps on climbing. So we we name all of our robots, uh -huh. uh, and that one was named Mouse when we started. And by the time it got to the top, uh, we had renamed it Mighty Mouse because it had broken, it had broken the string. So that was cool. Okay. We were pretty happy with that. So, uh, so little by little, we we were like, okay, well, we've gone as far as we can go on buildings. So let's go out into the world. And so then we started using these big balloons helium balloons tethered to the ground with robots climbing back and forth on the string um, and, and, and and MIT in, in, uh, two, in November that was that 2006 uh, no it was earlier than that um, 2004 probably maybe 2003 okay. no 2004 okay. probably okay uh, yeah probably 2004 for um, I, I don't know it might actually be on the YouTube channel okay description but I, I think it's 2004 um, it would it's definitely November it's a part of cell oh yeah it's a part of SEDS you're a part of SEDS right uh-huh yeah, yeah so there was okay. the uh, it's the space vision um, event that they have uh, that was a big space vision uh, um, uh, Elon Musk and General Pete Warden sat down like feet away from me uh, having a beer and they, uh, they actually hammered out the first rocket deal for SpaceX was to the Air Force and I was, I was feet away from that happening. Um, that, was a, that was a pretty big deal, yeah. Uh, a lot of stuff happens at SpaceX, at Space Vision, at, at, at Space Vision. It's a pretty cool environment. Yeah. So anyway, I mean, that, that's what we did. Like over time, we went from uh, buildings to balloons. We went from a couple experiments uh, under 50 feet, uh, 100 feet. Um, we had balloons snap off their neck. Like so, you know, there's the the balloon and the the string holding it down this part would just twist in the wind and then that the neck would just have material fatigue and the balloon would just float off in the sky and we're just hanging on to the neck and it falls to the ground like wow. that was 
that was a stupid, stupid experience. Um, so we had like stupid stuff like that happen in the beginning. We've definitely gotten better than that since then. Uh, but you know, we're just we're just a bunch of nerds trying to figure this stuff out, and and we don't really like doing a lot of simulations. We like actually testing things in the world. Um, more tinkerers than engineers. Uh, okay. There's there are some pluses and minuses, be, you know, by that by that plan. Um, and then uh, over time, we went to you know uh, 100 feet, 300 feet. Uh, as long as you're under that 300 foot mark, you can get away with a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, you don't have to get the FAA involved when you go over that. You have to get them involved immediately. Uh, so then we start moving to a thousand feet, and eventually we got to uh, a mile. We got six thousand feet, little over, little, little less than six thousand feet. So, um, yeah, that was those were all good. Those were that was kind of that was the, those were kind of what we consider the heydays of of the first lift part. Um, and then I told you things just utterly crashed in two thousand seven. Uh, how much? Uh, how much of that you want me to go over again? Well, okay. Let me see what I what I wrote down. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. It says yeah. Ended research around two thousand and seven. You go over a lot about it. I, I know you did. I guess some Navy research. Um, but yeah, yeah it said you lost. You you lost the building that funded the research, and that, that was during that whole real estate. Crash, yeah. bad loan thing that right. happened. That was yeah. kind of countrywide. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We really destroyed then. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We don't have to go into that. I mean, because I mean, everybody knows that was a complete disaster. You know. Yeah. So uh, I mean, I was seeing, I was seeing in Phoenix. You know, houses that sold for probably a couple hundred thousand being sold for like twenty to fifty k. You know. Wow. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. It was. It was. It was. It, it was a big deal in Phoenix. I mean, they had ton, we had tons of houses that just nobody was living in. And these were nice big houses. You know, yeah, right. Kind of, yeah. So it, yeah, it was just, it was a complete <laughs> utter disaster there for was somebody. A, there was a, so my building was valued around three and a half million dollars. Um, there was a building right next to mine that had million dollar apartments with these great you know 270 degree views of the water and if you look at the other side of the building it's you know the mountains i mean it, we i live basically in the middle of a postcard it's where i lived was beautiful and uh yeah you know what happened to me was pretty unusual but what happened to everybody else was they all got crushed i mean just the whole so it was, it was rough. It was rough on everybody. So once that happened, and, and there's a long story behind that, but the short version is once Liftport, uh, once Liftport crashed, or when, sorry, once the building crashed financially, uh, the Liftport didn't have a chance. You know, I had been supporting my team off of the income and revenue the revenues and and uh uh equity of the building mm -hmm. and yeah there was nowhere to go there was nowhere to go so one day a lot of people lost their jobs uh, i yeah. lost my building a lot of people lost their jobs so that was it was rough on everyone um so then we were just kind of in this stagnant stasis mode for a couple of years. Um, the company went out of business in 2003, 2007. Um, we still were kind of trying to do space elevator stuff. The space elevator conferences started happening in, I guess, 2010, um, holding their competition for the Centennial Challenge. So that was still happening. Uh, that was that was between two thousand six, seven, eight, nine. I think it ended in either nine or ten. Um, 
I wasn't really I wasn't really a part of that anymore. I was I was really involved with the beginning of it. Um, I was a judge and a part of the rules committee for a while. Um, I didn't like the way some of that stuff was being handled, so I pulled myself away from the competition. Uh, a couple of my team, a couple of my team actually continued to compete, so that was pretty cool. Um, uh, and eventually, uh, Tom Nugent, uh, who was my then research coordinator, um, uh, well, he he had quit by then. You know, with my full blessing, he had quit by then and uh, was working on the competition. And he and Jordan Care and a couple other people won, so that was really cool to see. Um, but by then, I was nursing my wounds. I spent two years playing Xbox and hanging out at my best friend's house. Uh, it was best days. It was not my best days. Yeah. Um, I went to school then for a while in 2008, uh, went back to school. And then uh, yeah, I was kind of in limbo for a while. And then we didn't really start the lunar elevator process until we had a couple 2010. But then we didn't start working on it really until 2011. Two thousand ten, two thousand and eleven is this when you started the lunar elevator stuff. Yeah. Um, it wasn't until two thousand twelve where we started getting some attention again. Um, we, did, we did our big Kickstarter in the summer two thousand twelve, and. That was both kind of a blessing and a curse. Um, on the on the very superficial level, uh, we asked for eight thousand dollars. We wound up with one hundred and ten thousand dollars. So that looked really really good. And then if you just scratch the surface a tiny bit, you'll see how many mistakes I made with that thing. That. that uh, you know, still four years, five years later, there's still people picking off about that kind of so that was that was a hard way, that was a hard set of lessons. But that was really the beginning of kind of focusing on the lunar elevator as a system that you could build with current technology, uh, and that's what we're working on now. That's that's. Uh, um, I'm in a I'm in a classroom right this second at the University of Puget Sound. I've got mm -hmm. two interns this summer, and we're still working on the lunar elevator. Um, we've got a, a book that's coming out in either November or now. I'm thinking it's more likely March. Uh, so we've been working this summer to put the book together. Uh, that kind of outlines the plans. Um, I go to meetings. I go to technical conferences fairly frequently, talking about this project. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's other there's a, there's other there's other stuff that we're doing now that's looking really good too. The the lunar elevator is really focus now. Um, and it has been for a couple of years now. Yeah, yeah. I remember in our in our last talk, you, yeah, you mentioned. Well, you went back to say you you went back to school in two thousand and eight, which you had just talked about. What did you study, by the way? Oh, uh, I went to International Space University. Remember our first conversation oh, okay. we about oh. uh, how SEDS is kind of a feeder program to ISU. ISU, right? Yeah. yeah. So they were very connected. Okay, you went there. Okay. That's cool. Um, yeah, they just said. Um, yeah, I was actually. Uh, huh? No, I was actually the uh, uh, American Alumni Association president for two years, from two thousand ten to twelve, or something like that. Nine to eleven, uh -huh. I guess. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, I like ISU. It's uh, it's a pretty amazing program. I've taken two different classes there. Wow. Once in Barcelona and one, another one in Washington, D.C. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I did check out the place. I noticed there wasn't really anything in Phoenix, so so that was kind of the end <laughs> of my research, you know. But uh, at least for now. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty no, happy with you're this. Gonna, you're going to have to go to France to catch it. Uh, they have a program yeah. that's going on right now in uh, Cork, Ireland. That looks really fun. Um, yeah. But yeah, you're gonna you're gonna have to pick up and uh, travel for it uh, if you want to. Yeah, go. I noticed. Yeah, yeah, I noticed. Yeah, well, maybe after my finish my degree, I'll I'll look into it. But right now, I'm they, kind of they, busy. Only, they only teach me. It's only a master's program, so you have to. Uh, yeah, you have to. Uh, yeah, they they don't teach undergrad at all. So oh, okay. So once you're finished with your undergrad. I would definitely look into it. It's a good program. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's then. Yeah. That's that's good to know. So I, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So. So yeah, 2010 to 2012, you got back in, and your your question was, what was possible now, and that led you oh. to the lunar elevator. Uh, you put down simple as possible system. Uh, you need to be able to build it in a single launch. Right. And probably wouldn't get another chance, and also use current technology um, yeah yeah we call that the the three mandates and and uh, uh, we really kind of stick with that like that um, we so this all happened at a, at a, one of the space elevator conferences the international space elevator conferences um, I was pretty frustrated because I'd heard all this stuff before and we still couldn't build the elevator. We didn't have the technology for it. So uh, my friend uh, Marshall Eubanks and I went out for what started out to be lunch and then turned into beer and margaritas and, and eventually a tequila or two showed up. Uh, and we're... He's kind of a madman, and he was he was scribbling equations on you know how those Mexican restaurants have uh, butcher paper on the table as tablecloths. So, okay, I, so I haven't seen one of those in a while, but yeah, okay. Right. All right. So he's he's sitting there scribbling formula on on this butcher paper tablecloth. Uh, huh. And we're like, okay, so if I put this question to you, what could we build now with current technology that gets the Earth elevator ultimately built? What would you do? And we were, we looked at uh, we looked at a couple things. Um, CubeSats were just starting to become popular, mm -hmm. like that technology was starting to become more normalized. Uh, so we looked at that. We looked at uh, different versions, like a Skyhook or something like that. And the more we started chatting, the more the moon elevator became more and more realistic. I'm like, all right, well, I like a lot, but you know, the guy's plan is ridiculous. It's like 80, 80 space shuttle launches to make. 800 space shuttle launches to make this thing work like that's not that's not possible Like all right, well, what if what if we could do it with just a single launch with a really really thin thread? Could we do it with that? And so that that's you know, it's, it's those kinds of conversations that you know over the course of the day um, You know, we just got closer and closer and closer to what, what we think is now the lunar elevator uh, so we are only going to get one shot. We're only going to be able to do this with one rocket. Um, you know, this is all before reusable rocketry started to become real. Uh, yeah. So we were expecting a two hundred million dollar rocket. So, uh, so that was that. I mean, that that kind of changes the equation a little bit. But still, um, what can we do with a single rocket? What is facing big fucking unicorns anymore. So no carbon nanotubes, no no mythical material. It has to be a real material. It has to be a real system. Um, so 
what we call purchase orderable technology. We want to just, you know, pull out the company debit card and buy a product. If that means a solar electric propulsion engine, if that means a rocket launch, if that means a spool of string from Toyobo, it doesn't matter. We, we want to be able to use purchase orderable technology for this system. And then uh, we want this to be about engineering, not research and development. Um, and then the final thing, which is really complicated our decision tree, is what we call sing, uh, Sputnik-like simplicity. It has to be the simplest possible system that will actually work. That's okay. really, really key because so many, so many launch systems, so many products fail because you're just like, oh, well, if we just do, you know, it can do this, but if it can do this, it's better. And if it can do this, it can, it's better. If it can do this, if it can do this and this and this and this and this. And eventually feature creep kills yeah. programs. So we're going to do one thing. We're going to do it very, very well. Uh, I admire Sputnik as the uh, first human-built satellite. Um, politics be damned, Russians, Soviets versus yeah. Americans be damned. Uh, it was an amazing machine, and and uh, uh, you know, is you know, the history of that is it was supposed to be a very, very large satellite, twelve hundred pounds or something like that. And uh, and when the when the Soviets realized that they were going to lose the space race to get this thing launched, they super simplified down to the little ball that we know. But it was supposed to go up and and measure atmospherics and have a whole bunch of other science, which would have been great. Uh -huh. But that little beep 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 beach ball that floats around the the, the Earth. I mean, it did its job amazingly well. So yeah, uh, yeah. So hats off to it. And so we want to be the same thing. Like we want this, you know, a very simple robot, a very simple string, a very simple landing mechanism. Everything should fit into a single rocket. We should be able to purchase order most of the technology. So uh, you know that we're not we're not oversimplifying, we're not minimizing how complicated this is. It's still really, 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 really complicated. Um, but those three mandates guide what we think is possible. So that's it. Um, on all, a lot of that, not all of that, but a lot of that came out of, you know, kind of the so, social lubricant of A, being frustrated with the current state of space elevator technology, and B, a couple margaritas on a hot day. So right. <laughs> we've refined it since then, but that's that's how it got started, so. I gotcha. Yeah. I gotcha. Yeah, yeah, you said, yeah, reusable rocketry came up, and then, um, yeah, that was the next thing that we had been talking about. Yeah, in 2000, it was like 15 to 20K a pound, or 20 to 30k per pound, I guess, depending on how you wanted to get up. And uh, yeah, you were always interested in the business case. Mm -hmm. That's what you're talking. I mean, if you, you can't make money, then it's kind of yeah, it's not going to happen. I, I can totally relate to that. Um, okay, yeah, re reusable rocketry that changed the game. Yeah, but do you believe that the lunar elevator still makes a money sense, but not so much the Earth elevator because of reusable rocketry? I'm very concerned about that. Um, I I still have the uh, I still have the hope that the Earth elevator will do what it's promised. Um, but I but I'm very concerned about the economics of that system. Whereas it doesn't matter. So reusable rocketry actually harms the business case of space elevators, whereas reusable rocketry really enhances the business case of the lunar elevator. Uh, and so if you're just looking at it from a dollars and cents perspective, um, from, a, from a utilitarian perspective, uh, I think the lunar elevator comes out ahead in a lot of ways. Um, there's 
economic uh, interests, there's social, political, and military capacity. I think the lunar elevator is kind of the vital first step. I, I'm not discounting the Earth elevator. Um, I'm certainly frustrated with the slow progress, but you know, hats off to the guys that are working on it. Um, uh, but I think I think the fastest way to prove that the Earth elevator should be built is by building the lunar elevator successfully. Okay, uh, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I I'm glad you agree, Athena. Definitely not everybody agrees with me on that. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, well, there's, there's definitely, I mean, I'm very familiar with the concept of scope creep. I'm, I'm very familiar with the concept of people trying to do things that aren't really possible yet and running into all kinds of, you know, and it's, I mean, I've seen that in, in aviation, different experimental aircraft designs and stuff. And yeah, I, I mean, a lot of times it makes sense to go back, I don't know, like get philosophical for a second, you know, go back to first principles, you know, I mean, what are you absolutely certain can work? And, right. and, and building that, you know, just going this one little tiny step, let's just put these things together and see if we can make something that actually functions. Right. And we, we kind of got to go back to the moon anyway. I mean, I know people want to just leapfrog to Mars, but it's not really realistic until we figure out some major issues and the moon will make those easier to solve. So, yeah. Yeah, it's it's kind of I I, I I can I can understand you know and I'd rather see something get built than nothing, you know. Right. That, that you know, uh, I I turn I turn months and I was thirty three when I started this. I don't have another seventeen years to dedicate to a project that might someday work. I want to, I want to, I'm, I'm willing to put another 17 years into a project that will work within that time frame. Uh, uh, but I don't, I don't have another 17 years to just wait on maybe. I want to build something that can actually work in the world or off world. Um, yeah, so I, I want to I want to see this the lunar elevator built, and I think what will happen is, uh, I, I think actually the key to carbon nanotube development is probably off space uh, off Earth. Uh, I think orbital development of carbon nanotubes might be the key to super strong holes. Uh, that's just, that's just a hunch, but I I think there's something there. So. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think we're gonna. I think the lunar system proves the use case and reduces the risk of building the Earth elevator. Uh -huh. um, the more reasonable rocketry comes into play, though, the more skeptical I am of the Earth elevator. Uh, it, it 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 just might be circumvented by that. Yeah. Athena, when we were when Edwards and I were first exploring this elevator. In the earliest days, we talked about reusable rocketry, and we, honest to God, thought that reusable rocketry was more science fiction than the space elevator. Right? We thought we thought uh -huh. the answers were right around the corner, uh -huh. and we thought we were onto something that was truly revolutionary. Uh, and no one that we even knew of was working on reusable rocketry. And, and I don't, I mean, I love the space shuttle program, but I don't think that that counts as reusable rocketry. I, I don't. I, I so. agree. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. yeah so, um, yeah, we, we really thought that, that a space elevator was easier than reusable rockets. And now you've got um, Blue Origin and SpaceX and Strata Launch and Virgin Galactic and, Sierra Nevada is working on something, and the X-Core is in trouble, but they have some technology. I mean, yeah. I don't know how you count it, but that's four, five, and six American companies working on reusable rocketry. And now uh, the French, the rest of Europe is working on it. Um, China and India are working on it. Japan's working on it. 
once you prove that reusable rocketry actually works, it's the new standard, uh -huh. the new de facto standard. So the more reusable rocketry comes into play, the less secure the Earth elevator is. And, and I know that no one in ISEC really likes that plan, like, right. like that reality, but I, I think, I think, uh, I, I think unless there is a major breakthrough in nanotechnology very, very soon, I think the L Earth elevator's in big trouble. So that's all frustrating, and I know none of my, my, none of my friends or allies at ISEC are gonna like that part, but that's where I stand on it, so. I hear you. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I hear you. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the way things are. I mean, you know, we, we never hear about all the other, all the other I mean, great things. We just hear about the one breakthrough, but, you know, you rarely ever hear about the other possibilities and, and yeah. just all the other frustrated people that pour all their time. I mean, right now, I, I know the IT industry is, filled with examples like that, you know, with, with uh, people working on different standards, you know, and then one gets accepted, the other ones that were really good, but, you know, it, it's like, yeah, so, you know, it, it's kind of the way of things, you know, and, um, you know, art's kind of like that, too, you know, everybody hears about, or, or the actors, you know, everybody hears about the one or few, you know, good actors, we don't hear about the thousands of others that, you know, we're also really good, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah, so yeah, it's uh, it's a common it's a common thing, yeah. uh, a common theme. So yeah, if I it was we, but the last time we talked about yeah the lunar, which would be gravitational stabilized as opposed to centrifugal stabilized, it's the the Earth one. You wanted to make money rather than publish papers, um, and then we started talking about Jerome Pearson. He said the philosophy was good, but a lot of times the math was wrong. Um, and then we started well, talking. Sorry, wait, I don't want to leave that one standing. Um, okay. Pearson's very good with his math. Uh, uh -huh. uh, uh, what, I, what I question is not his math or his construction methods. What I, co what I question is, uh, is, it, is it technologically and financially and logistically feasible? I'm not. Okay. I'm not questioning his math. I'm sorry if that came across earlier. Uh, okay. I, I I question whether or not eight hundred space shuttle launches is financially or technologically or logistically feasible, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what he required for his version of the elevator. He had a massively mammoth system that would have dwarfed the launch capacity of, of all humans, all rocket programs in the world, it would have dwarfed them. And so by that standard, his, his system was an interesting thought experiment. That's what got us to start rethinking about it. But I'm never going to throw the guy under the bus for math. I, I will throw him under the bus for logistics and financing, but not for math. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I understand. I'm, I'm good. We good with that. Um, yeah. Okay. And then we talked about Technion University. Am I saying? Am I saying that right? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Uh, did we talk about that? Yeah. So they've. Um, uh, Dr. Alex Kogan uh, ran a program in Technion. Technion's at, um, in uh, Israel. Uh, they ran a research project off of the lunar elevator and that's a that's a pretty good model it's not a perfect model but it's a pretty good model for what this thing is going to look like um, uh, that uh, you know I had some difference of opinion on on speed and throughput of the system and maybe we disagree on how the thing is going to get anchored but in the end it's a pretty good model it's, you know, Pearson's uh, baseline, Technion is another baseline, Liftport is a third baseline. Uh, you know, what we try to do is stand on the shoulders of giants and kind of take the good pieces from Technion and the good pieces from, uh, from, from Pearson 
uh, and you know, always keeping in mind the three mandates of you know, how can we build this now, right? We don't we don't want to build this thirty years from now. This isn't a thought experiment. This is a company to construct something, and so. Uh, we have done a lot of work to simplify and simplify and simplify and chip away all of the excess. And I don't think we're there yet. I don't. I, I think we have a good plan. I don't. It's. I don't think it's the right plan just yet. Um, we have a philosophy here, which we call the minimum, minimum viable answer. Uh, Athena, do you know the idea of minimum viable product that Silicon Valley uses? No, I don't. I haven't heard of that. Okay. So Sounds like a good idea. It's a good idea, right? So so in Silicon Valley speak, they talk in terms of um, MVP, minimum viable product, which is what's the fastest thing we can take to market and make money on and prove that we actually have a product. And our product might suck when it starts, but we can iterate and improve and and fix it, uh, and practically everything out of Silicon Valley these days starts with an MVP. And so, I kind of hate that model somewhat, you know, the, the venture capital model. But at the stage where we don't even know all the questions yet, let alone have all the answers, and so we don't consider any of our answers to be final and good. In the areas where we do have answers, we consider them to be good enough, always subject to more information, better refinement. So a minimum viable answer uh, is a good enough answer. It's not a great answer. It's not a perfect answer. It's not the answer. It's, it's a parameter. It's a starting point. So that's really what our textbook is about, is about minimum viable answers. Okay. Uh, what will get this thing accomplished, knowing that there's probably still errors here, right? Uh, um, that we've got all of it figured out right now. We have a lot of it figured out. We have a pretty strong rough draft. Uh, but that's, that's the point of the book, is both to highlight what we think we know, highlight some of the errors or options or opportunities, and then, you know, hopefully enlist other people to help us put the finishing touches on this thing. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really what this summer's project is about, is to get the book out the door and codify all the pieces that we kind of know and highlight mm -hmm. the pieces that we don't know. So. Gotcha. That's what you're working on this summer with the interns? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's not just me. It's a whole bunch of people. There's probably... There's probably 12, maybe 15 authors, and they're kind of subject matter experts. So it's it's a bunch of people putting parts in. A bunch of people. Okay. Sounds good. Um, what are you going to do with this video? Like the video that okay. we're capturing now? With this video, um, well, that's yeah, actually. I, mean, mainly, I, I huh? may actually want this uploaded to our YouTube channel because I think people would like this conversation. Uh, Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've never really sat down and done this kind of data dump of our history. And, and you know, of course, you and I left a bunch of stuff out, but yeah, I, I would say most people don't know what our history looks like. So uh, I, if you're, if, I would like to capture this video. Okay. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen with it once you're, once you're done with it and everything, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would like to capture it. And I mean, we have about, we have pretty close to 800 subscribers on our, on our channel. So, uh, uh, I, I, I think that, I think that they would like it. So yeah, if you, if you've got, if you, if you, if you don't have any specific plans for this, I'd like to throw it up on our channel. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. I wasn't sure how, how you feel about that. I've, I've talked to other people or I've, and video stuff. My boyfriend's got this business on the side called Red Pill Recording, and we've re-recorded stuff for things. And sometimes people are really leery, you know, just going to go out on YouTube, you know. And so it's kind of, but uh, yeah, I mean that's not a problem, <laughs> you know. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, I, 
I've yeah. been pretty much an open book for a long time. So yeah, if it, if yeah. that's if that's not a problem, I'll uh, I'll probably yeah, have really. um, I'll probably have one of my guys, uh, Griffin, get in touch with you and ask you okay. some questions about about that. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Let's let's do it again on next Wednesday or okay. Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. 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 Right. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.